Thank you so much uh, for joining us for this event. My name is Torian Easterling. I serve as the Senior Vice President for Population and Community Health uh, at One Brooklyn Health. Uh, we want to welcome all of you, those again who are joining us virtually and those of you, those of you who are in person uh, to this space. Uh, we want to hold this space and we hope this space uh, will continue to be a place where we can do ongoing uh, engagement and dialogue around current uh, and emerging initiatives uh, for East and Central Brooklyn, particularly around community health planning. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to dole out a few thank yous. I want to thank our partners for this event, uh, Brooklyn Community Collaborative, uh, as well as Health First. Uh, then I also want to thank uh, some of the vendors that we're working with as well. Uh, one, I want to thank uh, Transcendent Enterprise, uh, who has worked with us uh, for both of the events, uh, the Health Equity in Action event, uh, as well as being able to host this event here at Weeksville Heritage Center. you hear a little bit more about why we want to acknowledge uh, this space uh, in the land that we stand on. And uh, the uh, vendor who has provided uh, the nourishments uh, for this evening, uh, as well as for the last event, uh, Aunts and Uncles, uh, which is a local uh, restaurant here in Brooklyn on Ocean Avenue. Please continue to support uh, aunts and uncles. Uh, they have been uh, in the true partner uh, for us uh, as we've been pushing forward. Uh, so with all of that out of the way, uh, again, uh, we want to show some appreciation to the folks that we're working with. Let me talk to you a bit about this event itself. Uh, the Health Equity in Action event aims uh, to bring and convene stakeholders specifically those who live, work, and provide services in East and Central Brooklyn. Um, we think that the conversations that we're going to be hosting here will ha uh, hopefully engage uh, and allow folks to discuss efforts um, on health equity, systems change, and how we can strengthen collaboration with community partners. The overarching goal is to highlight current strategies and deploy and engage activities that will help us shift a paradigm in how we work together to drive towards health and well-being for all people uh, in this area. It is safe to say that East and Central Brooklyn is a significant area in the advancement of health equity. Uh, there is great interest in the organizing and, advocate, and advocacy activities towards achieving health and well-being for all of its residents. Despite these advancements, there remains to be great structural inequities. Uh, that for the residents in achieving true health and well-being. We know that our health care institutions are underfunded. We even see that some of our health care institutions are being forced to close their doors. We know that community organizations are siloed and undervalued. And we know that residents are disenfranchised and neglected in this entire process. We need new workflows. We need new ways of, of how we engage in our processes. And we need new metrics in how we define success. Yet we see this moment as an opportunity. It is not a prescription to embolden disharmony. We are calling folks to the table to bring both awareness to this shared vision, but also to marshal resources toward action. We cannot do this alone. We have already tried. We are tackling inequities in different ways, and we are facing various yet similar challenges. We want to reinvigorate a community health planning for East and Central Brooklyn. We want us all to share resources, and we will continue to support more local meetings, hopefully in forums like this, so that we can do this on a quarterly basis to share ideas and to share strategic ideas so we can move this forward. As a first step, what we're hoping to do is launch a robust and engaging campaign in support of this shared vision. We talked a little bit about this at the last Health Equity in Action event. Uh, that we can really use this campaign that will promote civic education and civic advocacy around health. Today is another step in that direction. In November, we held critical conversations about elevating patient and client voices to achieve health equity. We had speakers talk about innovative technologies where patient experience data can create opportunities for systems change. And tonight, we will host conversations around invest, advancing equity that will focus on the intersections of environmental justice, social drivers of health, and community action. We will highlight community strategies and tactics to ensure resiliency for our community, 
such as showcasing virtual power plants, relationships between environmental health, food sovereignty, and equitable housing. We will also spend a few minutes providing an update on efforts to support further community health organizing by leveraging the Medicaid 1115 waiver. So all of that is what we hope to accomplish tonight, uh, but essentially what we want this work to do is see this as a first step uh, in, uh, in the advocacy and justice for East and Central Brooklyn residents, and we need all of you to be engaged in that process. So in order to get to all of this work, I'm gonna step aside uh, because I wanna move forward with the program. And so the next voice that you will hear uh, will be Jeffany O'Garrow, uh, our population health data analyst. Uh, she, Jeffany is gonna come uh, and do a land acknowledgement for this space uh, and for our event. Uh, we think it's really important to, uh, given where we are uh, at Weeksville Heritage Center to always sort of center ourselves uh, on the shoulders that we stand on and the people who have already started this fight. Uh, followed by Jeffany, you will hear from uh, Ms. Colette Peen, Executive Director of East New York Restoration Development Corp. Uh, and we will also have remarks from uh, Assembly Member Stephanie Zinnerman, uh, who covers the 56th Assembly District, uh, as well as um, representative from the Brooklyn Borough President Office as well. Uh, I will bring them up uh, in that order, uh, but right now we will hear from Jeffany. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eastling, and good evening, everyone. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Lenape people. We recognize the resilience and persistence of the indigenous communities and their role in educating all of us about equity and the stewardship of the land throughout the generations. We acknowledge the place we are standing on as a sacred territory that was recognized as a free African-American community, the second largest in the pre-Civil War era. The settlement was named after James Weeks, a stevedore who was born into slavery and gained his freedom acquiring property, along with other African-American investors to build a self-sufficient town. We are reminded to reflect on the complex history of this land as we contemplate our way forward. Let us consider our role in reconciliation and actively contributing to building community guided by principles of respect, collaboration, and justice. May this acknowledgement serve as a reminder of the responsibilities we bear to the land and to one another. Let us thrive for a future where the stories of all who have shaped this place are honored and celebrated. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll have uh, Ms. Colette Peen come up and provide remarks as well. I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to speak here, and I want to thank you for coming to start this dialogue, to continue this dialogue, because I think to achieve the goals of health equity um, in any way, it's gonna take many different people from many different places to reach into our particular work and to elevate it to another work. Partnerships are gonna be key to this. As the executive director at East New York Restoration, a small community-based organization in Brooklyn, the only way we achieve as much as we have been able to is through different partnerships. We have built on an underused playground in the Pink Houses an adult fitness hub transforming what was a wreck into a vibrant, often used with exercise equipment, a walking track, et cetera. But that was in partnership with Maimonides District, with BCC, with the borough president, and most of all with our local elected officials who came together and supported this vision through the three years it took us to get NYCHA to agree to it and the six weeks it took to build it. Um, so that is an example of partnership that transforms people's ability to exercise by bringing it directly where they live. Multiplying that as many ways as we can is one of the ways we will achieve health equity. 
Another example of this kind of partnership is some years back, we worked with a NYSERDA-funded Solarize Brownsville project. We were the CBO that marketed, and over 200 people, households in Brownsville and East New York, now have solar panels that are leased to them, but are on their homes. And I was speaking uh, earlier to, to one of our um, partners around the importance of multiplying this and expanding it. Uh, that's the good part. The bad part was none of the people in the community worked on the project. So that was a real detriment. So we, we always seek to pair job development, job training, uh, because it is, not, it is good that people have lower cost energy, but it was not benefiting the community and uplifting it. There were people who could have worked on it, would have worked on it, but we have to find the structures to guarantee that as we fight for health equity, for environmental justice, that we are part of, part of the solution in every level, not only the people who must, um, who sometimes have the benefits, who definitely are feeling the ill effects. So through partnerships, I believe we can do this. This dialogue is a start, is a continuation, and it is what we must multiply. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Payne, for your words. Um, yeah, we know that meaningful community engagement is going to be important in this work. Uh, and so it's really important that we have all of the, the right partnerships at the table. And you see folks around the room, uh, those of you who are online, um, and we want to hear uh, your feedback. Uh, who is missing uh, from the room? Uh, who needs to be engaged? Uh, and how do we uh, continue to reach out to them? Uh, so with that, we're going to move forward. Uh, can we do the video next? Good evening, everyone. I am New York State Assembly Member Stephanie L. Zinnerman, representing Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights in the vibrant 56th Assembly District. Welcome back to the Health Equity in Action meeting, presented by One Brooklyn Health in partnership with SUNY Downstate and the Arthur Ashe Institute. For those of you returning and joining us for the first time, Thank you for engaging with us in dialogue about community health initiatives and demanding changes in our system to strengthen the health ecosystem in East and Central Brooklyn. We are united as a collective to improve health outcomes for our residents and recognize that each of us plays a pivotal role in ensuring our success. As your representative in Albany, I am laser focused on the issue of environmental justice. Whether it is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, or the development and implementation and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies, I am committed to combating environmental racism and advancing environmental justice for all. Not another child of color should leave a New York State hospital as an orphan. This must come to an end. We have to eradicate the circumstances that lead to black and brown women dying in childbirth. As a member of the executive board in the Legislative Women Caucus, I am fighting to fund more birthing centers, expand access to doulas and midwives, and ensure that women have the birth team of their choice who can support them during their entire birthing experience. These are just some of the measures that me and my colleagues in the New York State Assembly are championing on behalf of New Yorkers from Brooklyn to Buffalo. I am proud to be a member of the OBH family and a member of the Health Equity in Action team. The work you do is essential to our social determinants of health and ability to age in place with dignity and grace. Thank you for your leadership and your love for the Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights communities. Have a great meeting. Good night. All right. Uh, we want to thank the assembly member for providing remarks. We know that she is still in Albany uh, fighting the good fight. Uh, and we hope and we think that there are uh, going to be some good news coming out of Albany really soon as it relates to SUNY Downstate. Um, and so I wanted to lift that up as well, uh, that we also invited Senator Myrie. We've been engaging uh, assembly member Brian Cunningham. Uh, and although uh, we're uh, at One Brooklyn Health, we know that uh, all of our hospitals uh, are certainly at risk of closing uh, because of the structural inequities related to healthcare financing. Uh, and so it is important that our community 
has the equitable health care services that it needs. Uh, and even as a neighboring institution, we feel that it is our duty to make sure that all of those services are available. And no matter what neighborhood uh, those services are located. Uh, so we want to thank all of our elected officials uh, for standing strong uh, on this issue. Uh, and we reached out to them and many of them, although they, they were in Albany, were certainly in support of this event. Uh, so certainly want to thank the assembly member for providing remarks. Um, so with uh, I'm going to now call on uh, Lacey Tauber. Lacey is the Legislative Director for the Brooklyn Borough President Office, uh, who's going to provide a few remarks as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Easterly, and for adding me to the very last minute. I will try to be quick. My name is Lacey Tauber. I'm the Legislative Director for Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Reynoso. Um, health equity and environmental justice are amongst the biggest priorities of our office. Uh, you may have seen that in November we put out a comprehensive plan for the borough that looks at the intersection of public health and planning. And also um, the borough president has been a big champion of black maternal health in the borough. Um, I actually came here today to talk about something else we're working on and to try to recruit some help from this um, from this room, which is a partnership that we are doing with the Department of Environmental Conservation from the state. Um, they have been busy over the last year monitoring air quality in the borough or in parts of the borough where the air quality is the worst. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, Central and Eastern Brooklyn are part of that study area. And uh, as you know, I think probably also, asthma rates for children and adults uh, in this community are um, amongst the worst in the borough and in the city. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is um, we're, we're partnering with them to make sure that there's community input based on the data that they've been collecting on mitigation strategies. What can we actually do to try to improve the air quality um, all across the borough, um, but particularly in some of the areas that face the, the worst issues. Um, so we have put together a community advisory group. We're going to be looking at policy interventions, um, permitting changes, and also funding. Um, this is part of the uh, state's efforts um, on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So there's uh, some funding attached to this work as well. And we really want voices at the table from Central and Eastern Brooklyn in this process. Um, so if that's something that's of interest to you, um, I have some flyers outside. Uh, you can come talk to me after. If you're watching on Zoom, I'll give you my number because that's easier than spelling my email. It's 718-802-3894. Um, thanks again. We would love to come back and talk more about some of that other work another time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lacey. All right. How's everyone doing? Good? Good. All right. Just want to check in really quickly. All right. So the moment that we've been waiting for, uh, we're going to go ahead uh, and bring up our panelists. Uh, and to do that, I want to introduce uh, our moderator. Uh, it, is, uh, it is an honor for me, uh, absolutely, to be introducing this person. Um, the, our moderator is a dedicated mother, writer, uh, advocate for food justice, proudly calls Brooklyn her home, uh, also a comrade uh, who I've worked with uh, for a better half of these past 10 years, uh, both at the health department but also in this community. Uh, when, I was, uh, when, I was, uh, when I came to One Brooklyn Health uh, and a former CEO asked me to lead food, food uh, as medicine initiatives for the system, uh, this was the first person I called. Uh, because Ray Gomes has always been in our community really pushing food sovereignty uh, and ensuring that our community uh, was really engaged uh, in making sure that these systems were in place. Uh, and so I knew that Ray was the person that we needed to work with. Uh, and since then, we have uh, launched the Roots to Wellness Project in partnership with Ray, with Grow NYC, with Brooklyn Packers uh, to ensure that we are uh, supporting uh, our patients at, at One Brooklyn Health uh, to receive uh, healthy produce. Uh, and there's so much more that we'll be going to be doing. Uh, but we've asked Ray uh, in her role uh, to, uh, to help lead uh, this conversation that we think is really important uh, and is timely uh, for our community. Uh, and so without for further ado, uh, I call to the stage Ray Gomes.
Sure. Can we make the intro with my name? Uh, yeah, let's do the intro first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I love this space. I really do love this space. The energy is so good in here. Um, so um, we have a esteemed panel for you this afternoon. Uh, Danielle Donnelly, Assistant Vice President of Sustainability Programs and Climate Friendly Homes Fund, um, the Community Preservation Corporation. Uh, Danny, Danielle Donnelly is the Assistant Vice President overseeing sustainability programs. Uh, she's leading the company's efforts to improve build environment and mitigate the effects of climate change on our communities. She's responsible for working with CPC's internal or originations and equity staff, as well as borrowers and external partners to advocate for and implement financing solutions to improve the built environment, among many other things. Uh, Austin Cole is a graduate student, uh, City Planning and Business Administration at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, came all the way from there <laughs> to our little neck of the woods in Brooklyn. Uh, Austin grew up in Springfield, Ohio, and is the son of families from the Mississippi Delta in Birmingham, Alabama. He is a master's student in city planning and business administration at MIT, a member of MIT Graduate Student Union, the MIT Black Graduate Student Association, and the Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, J. Philip Thompson, PhD, uh, should be no stranger to folks uh, doing this work. Professor of Urban Planning and Politics, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the former Deputy Mayor for Strategic Policy and Initiatives. J. Th J. Philip Thompson is a Professor of Urban Planning, as I said, uh, from 2018 to 2021. He was the Deputy Director of, in um, New York. As Deputy Di Director, Phil oversaw nearly 20 agencies, including small business and workforce, consumer affairs, immigration, and youth programs. He was also the co-chair of the Task Force on Racial Equity and Inclusion and a member of the Charter Revision Commission. So part of what is bringing us here today is a, con a conversation on um, virtual power plants. Uh, we will kind of get to that, but before we have our conversation, we just want to frame and kind of put everyone on the same page about what they are, so. They're being billed as a cleaner and greener way to avoid blackouts. And they could be one solution to a looming global energy crisis. But what are virtual power plants? And why are companies like Google and GM getting involved? Virtual power plants, or VPPs, are pools of decentralized energy resources. Resources like electric vehicles or electric heaters controlled by smart thermostats. The VPPs will, with permission from customers, use advanced software to react to electricity shortages by backing off the consumption of those resources. It'll use techniques like switching thousands of EVs from charge to discharge mode, or prompt electrical heaters to lower their output. The goal is to back off on unnecessary energy consumption to ease loads on electricity grids when supply is short and avoid disaster. Here's Mark Dyson, the Managing Director of the Carbon-Free Electricity Program at the Energy Transition Nonprofit, RMI. We've seen on display over the last few years significant existential threats to the reliability and resilience of our power system in the United States with blackouts in Texas, blackouts across the Eastern interconnection. We have a reliability crisis in this country and we need every tool at our disposal, including virtual power plants to help address it. RMI will be hosting a new initiative known as the Virtual Power Plant Partnership, or VP3. It'll be working with big names like GM, Ford, and Google, who say they want to establish standards for scaling up the usage of VPPs together. Each of our partners, each of our members, has their own business around virtual power plants. What we seek to do in VP3 is use the insights, the experience, the lessons learned from those companies and other companies around the country and around the world to understand how to grow the market for any kind of company who wants to participate in the VPP market. VPPs have already improved grid reliability in places like Germany and Australia. They're poised for explosive growth in the United States 
thanks to new or enlarged tax incentives for sustainable energy efforts in 2021's Inflation Reduction Act. Our goal is to educate policymakers and regulators on the opportunity that virtual power plants present in the United States to improve reliability, improve affordability, and accelerate decarbonization of the U.S. power grid. And RMI estimates that by 2030, VPPs could reduce U.S. peak demand by 60 gigawatts. That's the average consumption of 50 million households. All right. So welcome. Thank you again for being here. Uh, I didn't thank Dr. Easterling for his kind remarks. I didn't. Someone recorded that? <laughs> okay. All right. So, Kent, we've read your bio, so we know kind of what you do um, in the world of work. But uh, share something about yourself that wasn't really mentioned in the bios and what brought you to this work. Let's start with um, Mr. Thompson here. I went to the 1963 March on Washington. I was in the daycare, child care section. Um, and because there was child care, my mother was able to spend the entire day at the demonstration, and she actually was on the front row. And uh, one of the things that uh, brings me here uh, is that I think really to organize communities to really participate and have a voice and an active role in policy making on things like the energy transition and VPPs, it takes resources that often are lacking. And I'm sure there are, there are some people who would have been here if they had had childcare. Um, but that's one of the things that's super expensive and community organizations generally can't afford. So um, part of what I want to talk about later is what, in terms of VPPs is we have to get more resources for organizing so that people can participate, can have a voice, can be involved. And that's something our parents and grandparents thought of in 1963. I had a good time at childcare. I remember that, you know. And I was very busy the whole day, and they fed us all day. Um, so. Thank you for that. I'm a huge advocate of child for freedom and revolution. Um, is this thing on? Yes? OK. Danielle, can you share a little bit about it yourself and you know what brought you to this work? There we go. <laughs> wow, OK. That's powerful. Um, so I haven't been working in sustainability for a very long time. I've really been only in this space for six, five, six years. Before that, I was in field and community organizing for political campaigns and did a lot of work in communities that I did not belong to and had to learn the hard way how to let people lead when you're supposed to be leading an effort um, and how to elevate voices um, who don't often get the opportunity to speak. Um, I worked in communities across the U.S. in 2016 and saw a lot of victories in uh, voter registration efforts and some of the issue-based campaigns that we uh, put on, but also saw a lot of disappointment that year as well. So um, I think what I'm bringing from that experience is uh, an understanding of sustainability, but also an understanding of how to let communities lead the way when we're talking about the built environment and what they need. Y'all are jumping ahead, but thank you. <laughs> Austin. Um, yeah, thanks. Does that work? Okay. Um, yeah, I think, I guess this was partially in my bio, but what brings me here to, to environmental justice work and into a lot of this work gener more generally is, um, like I said in my bio, my, my mom is from the Mississippi Delta. She's from Greenville, Mississippi. Um, Every, my mom passed away six years ago from, from um, ovarian cancer. Half of her high school graduating class has died from cancer in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, my dad is from Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama, massive amounts of the black neighborhoods, which are tend to be 99% black because of historic segregation, are also um, have a massive incidence of COPD, lung cancer, asthma, 
um, because of the way that they were cited and because of the institutions and the, the buildings that were cited there. So when we talk about environmental justice and health equity and black liberation and all of these things that all come together, um, you know, Mississippi and Alabama, I'm biased, I guess, but are two of the most revolutionary places in the United States because of the conditions that people have had to fight, because of the things that people have had to overcome. Um, and so for me, I'm, I'm here uh, because of my family and because of, you know, the, the way that they invested in me and loved me. Um, and so I think a lot of this work and a lot of my understanding of that comes from the, you know, the, the way that both these injustices um, tend to intersect on people's lives, but also the way that people's resilience um, and ability, you know, to wage resistance against those injustices has created some of the, you know, the biggest innovations that we have seen, not only in this country, but also in the world, right? And talking about the black freedom movement and other spaces like that. So that's a lot of the, I think, the, the legacy um, and the reason that, that I'm here. Thank you. Beautifully said, everyone. Um, the work that you do as if you're talking to a five-year-old. Simple, simple. You want to start, yeah? Yeah, I'll go. This is cheating because my my niece is six and she's very inquisitive. So, I, yeah, it's easy. I've had practice. Um, I, I think for me, I guess, and I'm a student right right now. So for me, um, I, you know, study and work on the questions of how do our people get free, um, and how do we get from where we are right now to freedom, um, and what do we need to do along the way um, in order to to get free, um, and to stay free, and to defend our freedom and, and our communities. Um, yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, so I don't have a lot of practice with uh, younger people around me explaining what I do, but I do have to translate sustainability, the importance of energy efficiency, decarbonization, electrification to lenders every day. Um, and so most of what I'm doing is challenging people in the finance industry to think about the environments they're, they're financing and how developers are creating living spaces for people. What do we want to see out of those living spaces? How do we want them to affect the people who are living in them? And how do we maintain those living spaces long term so that they are comfortable, that they can withstand major climate events, uh, that we have good indoor air quality and we can be healthy. Um, and so it's a lot of translating. I haven't had practice in a while. Um, but, you know, I would say we want to make people healthy and strong and we want to make the earth healthy and strong. And, and that's basically it. Um, my challenge is explaining to MIT grad students, <laughs> which often is like, there are a couple of them here. Tala is a physicist and computer science PhD student, and Brooke is a mechanical engineer and urban planning student. And so I usually have the challenge of, how do I sound smart <laughs> in front of people who are way ahead of you in so many things? Challenges all over. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so let's start with you, Danielle. Uh, in registering for this event, uh, we asked folks to think about cross-sector strategies to achieve environmental justice. Uh, some of the responses included healthcare, education, sanitation, housing, food. Um, firstly, how do you define environmental justice? And how are you involved with or envisioning how these different um, sectors can strategize to advance environmental justice? Very long-winded, but how do you define environmental justice and how are all of these sectors sort of playing a part of that in your work? Yeah, so I think from the financing perspective and from a financing system and housing perspective, environmental justice is uh, the... I guess the coming together of uh, community demands and community needs and uh, ESG uh, initiatives from financing uh, institutions and how do we make sure that those ESG initiatives are actually achieving something. Um, and for folks who don't know what ESG is because acronyms are awful, um, it's environmental social governance. And so a lot of organizations 
say that they're doing sustainability or affordability or um, thinking about the assets that they're investing in, um, but not actually achieving a lot in the end. And so it's, it's thinking about the end we're trying to achieve and bringing that all the way forward when we're talking about which projects we move forward with, how we finance them, and where we uh, devote state dollars to that. Austin, you want to go next? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess it, for me, environmental justice um, kind of comes from a couple things. So one, the, you know, it comes from environmental injustices, right, that have been perpetuated. Um, and that is basically the understanding that, like, environmental harms, climate harms, the changes of the climate um, are, are, are happening, are a fact, right? But the, the um, negative aspects of those harms tend to concentrate with other negative aspects in our social, political, economic living, right? So the same people that are harmed by those um, social, economic, political inequities are the same people that are the most vulnerable and made the most vulnerable um, by, uh, you know, choices um, you know, of where they are cited to live, of where they can work, of where, you know, the places, the um, polluting industries around them are located. And so they end up having disproportionate, um, disproportionate negative impacts, right, of um, environmental harms and of climate harms, right? And so what ends up happening is that the most vulnerable and typically the least responsible for the climate change, for climate change are the ones that are paying the biggest cost, right? And I, you know, tend to like, you know, not anymore say climate change, but actually say climate crisis because climate change is a fact. It's happening. The Earth's you know, the temperature is changing, weather patterns are changing, but climate crisis is a choice that is happening because, you know, the institutions that are supposed to respond to those things are not doing so, or not doing so in a way that protects everyone, that protects the most vulnerable among us. And so environmental justice is an attempt to, one, resist those harms that are still going on, right, that are still being perpetuated, um, that both happened in the past but are ongoing. Um, it's an attempt to repair, you know, the damage that has been done um, in the environmental sphere and in, you know, the disproportionate climate impacts. And then it's an attempt to restructure the relationships between um, people and environment, between people and others and institutions in order to achieve, you know, a healthier environment, in order to achieve, you know, um, a dignified life. Um, and those three R's are part of this, this idea of the just transition um, that many folks um, before me have talked about and sort of the tagline that they use is uh, transition is inevitable, right? Climate transition is inevitable, but justice is not. Right? And so that's why we're working here and being intentional about putting justice at the forefront of climate and of environment. I would just, I would just add that I knew the two people who coined the term uh, environmental justice. It was Charles Lee and Ben Chavis. And I think it was around 1980, 1981, Charles Lee was one of the founding members of Asian Americans for Equality in Chinatown here in New York. Um, Asian Americans for Equality was formed when um, Confucius Plaza, those huge buildings uh, in downtown Chinatown, Manhattan, uh, when that was under construction and they didn't hire anyone from the neighborhood um, to work on that project. And so the communities organized and I was involved with that and we shut down the construction site until they hired people from the community. And so Charles Lee was one of the leaders in that. Then later he teamed up soon after with Ben Chavis, who had just, he's my third cousin by the way, he had just gotten out of jail. Uh, he was part of the Wilmington 10 where I think they did nine years on a false charges of a number of black folks associated with the Panther Party they said they um, shot a police officer, and then it turned out that it was false testimonies and it was a lie, and they were released from jail, I think, in 79. Um, and then Ben be uh, became a minister in the United Church of Christ. They had an office on 121st in Riverside, and him and Charles got together and created a racial, uh, a um, EJ office, economic, Justice Office of the United Church of Christ, and then they wrote this article. 
that coined the term. And what I also remember was what they were mad about at the moment. That sewage treatment plant on 125th Street and Riverside, do you know where it is? There's like a park on top of it. That plant treats sewage from the Upper West Side. And, and the people in the Upper West Side didn't want a sewage treatment plant, and Ed Koch was mayor, so they decided to pump their sewage all the way to Harlem, and the thing stank like hell when they started it, you know, and the community protested, and that's what really was the, the issue. That w it was just like, wait a minute. Like, you just pump garbage to our neighborhoods, you know, and so anyway, that's, that's kind of some background. Thank you, our in-house historian. It's a great perspective. Always. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, while we have you here, in-house historian, um, you've been leading community investment strategies for decades, both as a government leader and an academic. Um, can you name, this is gonna be a challenge, can you name an effective strategy for organizations and government to engage in engage community and also center community. This is before we get to VPPs. Right? <laughs> um, I think I think the whole organizing drive that led to uh, interfaith being kept open, that led to Brookdale and Kingsbrook and interfaith now being part of One Brooklyn, the leadership of Bruce Richards, people like Bruce sitting right here in the front row, and Roger, and workers in the interfaith hospitals that they organized, who took over the hospital, and the 38 charrettes we did with elected officials over two years of weekly meetings, you know, to get the whole community on the same page about we're determined to fight for better health right here. That's a great example. I'm trying to get a hard question for you, but okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, Austin, um, so the theme for this conversation is partnerships to uplift environmental justice. Can you help define some of the key terminology, because you're the student, that's your role here. <laughs> uh, you started defining a little bit about climate change, um, but if you can talk about sustainability and other related terms, I think it would be helpful even to talk about like the difference between environmental justice and climate justice, because I feel like those terms can be used interchangeably. Um, and what systems like food and housing and transportation play a role in environments? Yeah, um, so yeah, so I, I started, to, like you said, started defining climate change a little bit um, and, and environmental justice and climate justice. I think um, they, they are tend to be used interchangeably and I think a lot of the history of that, like, like Phil was saying, is around the environmental justice movement, which tended to be more like localized and thinking about actual, you know, um, typically either policy or private decisions that had cited, you know, sewage plants or highly polluting, um, you know, companies and, and factories in, you know, black and brown neighborhoods and in poor and working class neighborhoods. Um, and so a lot of the environmental justice focus was actually about like the physical environment of our community and why are all of these things that are necessary in theory f to be, um, to exist, right, for our kind of industrial system to work. You need factories that are producing stuff. You need, you know, sewage. You, the sewage has to go somewhere. But why do those things always seem to be in our neighborhoods, <laughs> right? <laughs> the sewage plant, you know, everybody, everybody poops, right? Why is the sewage only coming to our, <laughs> to our neighborhood? And so environmental justice is a lot about that, is, tends to be typically historically about that. Whereas climate justice has come more recently, right, with the kind of, um, popularity of climate change, and actually a lot of climate justice focus originally started abroad um, in other countries, in countries in the Caribbean, in the continent of Africa, um, all in you know Southeast Asia and Oceania, where all these countries that are feeling the brunt of climate change far before people in the US have really cared at a high scale. Um, and have been saying for years, you know, that this climate change is caused by the same unjust system 
um, that operates in the world today, right? And that the countries that have kind of bared the brunt of this um, system of development that we have in the country, I studied international development in college and now study economic development, so I'm not gonna go down that train. <laughs> but that system is you know, reflected in what is happening in these climate outcomes, right? And so climate justice, um, really has come primarily from that kind of external point in the U.S., but those things have merged a lot because obviously they're connected, right? You can't talk about local environmental injustices. Um, you know, you can't talk about when you're trying to get on the train and there's 10 feet of, you know, 10 inches of water that you're wading through just because it rained, right? And because that's a very localized problem without talking about the broader, you know, sea level rise and issues of climate change more broadly, right? And so that's why now a lot of these things have really um, come together, right? And a lot of the focus on, is on environmental and climate change together, environmental and climate justice, sorry, together. Um, you asked about sustainability as well. Um, and sustainability is interesting because it's one of those words that, you know, I use all the time, unfortunately, but I also <laughs> really can't stand because it's been used so much that it, it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, but I think initially what people think of environmental sustainability, um, but I think for me sustainability is really about how do we maintain, how do we, um, how do we guarantee the long-term um, the long-term maintenance of our communities, of our people, of our social systems, of our institutions, and of our environment in a way that allows us to live the lives um, that we want and need, right? And so obviously a lot of that comes from environment, right? And comes from, you know, sustaining the environment. But a lot of that is also about social sustainability, about our social networks and about our communities, about economic sustainability, right? About the ability um, that for me having a job does not take away, you know, and me making, you know, the money I need to live is not based on someone else, you know, having an undignified life and someone else not being able to meet their needs. So I think at the end of the day, sustainability is really about how do we have a system where, you know, my freedom is not premised on someone else's unfreedom, right? That actually, you know, we have a system where, you know, there's, there's not, I don't believe kind of in utopia, but I do believe in like the elimination of, you know, structural forms of, of injustice, right? And so that when we are coming um, into, you know, in, in, when, when folks are coming into, you know, their adulthood and their lives that they can look forward and say, there are opportunities for me here, in my community. I don't have to leave my community, right? Because it is sustainable. It is a place where like my family has been here and I can see myself and see a future for myself here. Or if I do choose to leave, that's on me. That's a thing that I want to do and I'm not being coerced or forced out, right? But I'm making that choice fully upon my free will. Um, so for me, sustainability is, is, is that, right? Is really like creating those opportunities for people to live and thrive um, and guarantee that they can do so, you know, throughout their entire life. And I think that when we talk about environmental justice, climate justice, sustainability, you know, we, a, a lot of this stuff gets focused on green technology and we're going to talk about virtual power plants, but all of these things are so interconnected, right? You can't talk about, you know, green technology and putting, you know, a solar panel on your home if your home has no insulation and it's 40 degrees in the winter, Right? You also can't talk about that if you don't have a home or you're you know, being evicted every, you know, every three to six months and your kids can't go to the same school if you're being evicted, if you don't have stable housing and you're not able to go to that same school system. And if they're not in the school system, then and if they don't have stable schooling, then how are they going to learn what they need to to get a job? And if they don't have a job, how are they going to pay for their housing, for their food? And if they don't have a job and be able to pay for housing and food, then they're probably going to be eating terribly and their health is going to deteriorate. And then how are they going to pay for health care? And so all of these things, right, are all interconnected. You can't really look at one of them. Obviously, all of us have to focus on things, right? We can't all do everything at once, but that's why partnerships are so important, right? Because you can't actually, you can't look at any of this stuff um, as one single solution. And for me, that's why my, my work and the way that I kind of focus on things is really looking at collective liberation, right? Because that idea is that all of us, 
You know, it's all of us or none of us, right? And that requires us to think in all of these spaces and think beyond all of these individual silos where grant money is flowing down or where government institutions are agencies over only housing or only over food or only over energy. And, oh, sorry, you can't do that program because it doesn't fit the stipulations of XYZ thing, right? And so... Um, I'll stop, but, but that I think for me is why all these things are so interconnected is because you can't start to address any of these issues without really having that, that understanding that they're all interconnected and that we have to work on all of this together and continue to work on it together. It's not about finding the perfect solution, it's about the process of building um, a better world together. I just want to say quickly that I'm old enough to remember that you ate tomatoes in the summertime, and they tasted really good. Yeah, they really do. And you ate strawberries in the spring. And that's when you also ate green peas in the spring. And your, your string beans in the spring. And they all tasted really good. And then in the fall, you ate you know, your rutabakers and your potatoes and your spe So, and it all tasted really good. Mm -hmm. Now, the stuff's in the supermarket year-round. Most tomatoes, most strawberries, they're grown in Mexico or in deserts in the Southwest. Then they ship them at 38 degrees for 1,500 miles on average, and they ripen which uses all containers. kinds of carbon, by the way. Yeah. And then they, they ripen like, you know, later they pick them green, and they don't taste like anything. So I think, you know, and it's crazy how much energy it takes to sustain that, it benefits big corporations. That's, that's why it's done that way, because that's where they own, have these massive farms and so forth. So as part of a corporate food strategy, if we're going to actually cut back on carbon, if we're going to have to rethink how we grow our food. We're going to have to do it regionally. You don't eat strawberries all year round. You don't eat tomatoes all year round. Doesn't mean you can't can them. Doesn't mean you can't have good food. In fact, the food was better tasting when we had regionally grown food. But I just wanted to make that connection. You know, the energy stuff and the food stuff is all intertwined, and it's related to our bad diets. Our food don't t doesn't taste like anything. It's because we've been sucked into this corporate machine um, that's bad for the earth and bad for us. You're trying to suck me into a food conversation. <laughs> I am not taking the bait. Although as someone who is very strict about eating seasonally, I have to say that tomatoes in the summer, once you really have them, there's really nothing else. There's really, sandwiches, right? I mean, every Who would eat a tomato day. sandwich? Because, you know, but that used to be delicious. Yeah. OK, that's for the next panel. Uh, <laughs> uh, Danielle. Uh, so, you know, on this theme of partnerships and you know, center and community, um, could you tell us more about how CPC uses thought leadership and funding decisions to increase equity in development projects and, com and communities? Yeah, and it's something that we think about throughout all of the programs we administer. And I was listening to Austin talk about sustainability. And I was thinking about how CPC and organizations like CPC work in those stipulation spaces. We work within the confines of what the government lets us do, what the market lets us do, what we can get away with telling developers to do. Um, and we've been able to push really far since we established as an organization 50 years ago and since we established a sustainability department about you know, 12, 10 years ago. Um, we've been able to educate a lot of people around what is possible with financing and how you can push your buildings further to reduce carbon, to reduce operational cost, uh, and to reduce uh, uh, energy consumption on the operations side. Um, I think one of the challenges that we're looking forward to is um, valuing the embodied carbon of construction and how the work we're doing to create the sustainable housing today for people years and years to come is polluting the earth right now um, and how we can be better about material selection and creating healthier indoor environments because of that but also reducing carbon emissions through construction by cr uh, choosing those materials. Um, and so when I think about the impact that CPC can have as a thought leader, um, 
it is really in our ability to hold the money and push in the direction that um, communities are telling us is the right one um, and listening to the communities that we work in and not only to the developers, but the people who are going to inhabit the homes that we finance. I'm curious, um, what is one decision um, that you think speaks to issues that communities are facing and also you know, contributes to climate friendly homes and yeah. Yeah, I think a focus on decarbonization in the context of electrification has been really tough. Say what decarbonization is. Yep, so decarbonization is the reduction of carbon emissions in the operation of anything, but in this context we're talking about multifamily housing. Um, and so when we talk about decarbonization and electrification, it is the removal or transition away from fossil fuels for space heating, domestic hot water heating, appliances, et cetera. Um, and so a lot of programs and a lot of money is focused on that direction right now, getting people away from natural gas, getting people off of uh, oil, which is still burned commonly in multifamily buildings across the city, um, reducing particulate pollution through that. Um, but one challenge that we have right now is electrification is expensive. It's expensive to install, it's expensive to operate, and without energy efficiency, and um, similar to what Austin was talking about, where uh, if we don't improve the quality of our homes and the, our ability to reduce consumption, we're just shifting a burden in a different direction. It's a, it's a decarbonization and a uh, reduction in pollution, but it is an increase in cost and an increase in um, education for people to be able to operate these systems. Um, and so a lot of the challenge right now is education around improvements to building envelope and building operations and load reduction. So that is the, uh, the amount of energy it takes to heat or cool a space, reducing that. Um, so we are reducing the amount of electricity we're consuming, we're creating more sustainable uh, electrical infrastructure for our communities, and then we are electrifying the, uh, the mechanisms within our buildings that keep people comfortable. Thank you. Could not have been easy to <laughs> synthesize a lot of your words into you know, a couple of seconds, uh, so I appreciate that. Um, so let's jump into um, a little bit of what we were sort of testing out and what we showed you all a video on. Um, let's start with you, Austin. Could you please share a little bit more about virtual power plants and how they address key challenges in energy conservation and efficiency? And then I will go to you, Mr. Thompson, to talk about some of the challenges and the benefits. Does that sound good? Yeah? Um, yeah, so I mean, you saw the video and a little bit about virtual power plants. Um, basically, as a, a, to, to sum it up, virtual power plants are a collection of different devices, um, different resources that can be utilized, um, that, that are connected, right, that are interconnected. And typically, they're also connected to the broader electrical grid, right, to the broader electric grid. Um, and they are utilized in a sort of in a... Um, uh, actively, they're controlled actively in order to, instead of bringing a new coal-fired power plant or bringing a new energy resource to meet the demand for energy, you you know spread the energy out in a better way, or you make it more, um, you use more efficient devices, right, and more efficient um, use of the energy that already exists on the grid to make up for the new demand that you have, right? So if you have, you know, if you say that, you know, this new building, if we have, you know, X number of people living in this neighborhood and that's gonna go up by 20%, typically what would happen is you would say, okay, well, we need to increase the capacity to generate energy, to generate electricity by 20%, right, in that neighborhood, instead of, you know, creating a new power plant, like I said, if you have a virtual power plant, you can say, actually, you know, we can bring this in and we can be using our energy more effectively, we can be turning off devices at certain times, we can be, you know, having people elect to decide that they want to, you know, leave their thermostat a little bit higher in the summer or a little bit lower in the winter to get savings, right? And then all those things in the system add up to overall less energy use and savings for people and, and savings for the utilities as well, right? And so 
the idea behind virtual power plants and the reason, I think in the video they address this as well a little bit, is one of the main reasons and one of the main, um, the main benefits is around reliability, right? Because if you have all of these different parts of a system interconnected and you can switch ones on and off, if one part of the system you know, goes down and you have a solar panel up on your roof, you might be able to actually use that solar panel you know, to generate energy if there's a blackout. Right, or if there's something that is happening, you know, in other parts of the grid, but not affecting you. So there's that ability um, to have more reliable, um, localized energy. Right. Then there's also the affordability thing. Like I said, if you're using less energy, you're also paying less for it. Right. Um, the way that that works right now is typically utilities are taking some of that savings, and some of that savings goes to customers. Right. But I think Phil will talk a little bit, maybe a, a little bit about the community aspect too as well. Um, and then the final part is about decarbonization, right? So as you're doing these things, you're all, because you're using less energy and because you're bringing on different types of energy sources, you know, during peak energy demand times is like, so you think the hottest days of the summer, you know, at 2 p.m. or, you know, um, right now in the winter, we don't mostly in this part of the country use electricity. It's usually gas and oil, right? But, but it could happen in the winter as well where a lot of people are using energy um, and a lot of those, um, the grid is like over, what they would say is like oversubscribed, right? It's overused. And I think probably people remember, I was pretty young when this happened, but the, um, the uh, blackout that happened on the whole East Coast, right? And that was in the summer time, right? Because the grid sort of, the grid failed. And so at those peak times, what typically happens now um, in New York City and around the country is that utility plants fire up coal-fired or gas-fired power plants. And these, in New York City, I think the average age of these plants is they're 50 years old on average. So that means these are old, inefficient power plants that are among the most polluting in the country, right? Um, because, they're, because they're old, because they don't have the latest technology. And those are used at those peak times to meet the demand for electricity. And so that's not only contributing to pollution, but also New Yorkers pay $450 million a year in taxes to the utilities just so the utilities can have the right to turn those on, or just so utilities maintain them and so they can turn them on. In some years, they barely use them at all, right? I think on average, they get used about 25 days a year, right? So we're paying almost like half a, half a billion dollars to put on, to turn on these super polluting beaker plants. And so the idea with virtual power plants is that you can avoid having to turn those things on because if you can distribute the energy better instead of having to use, you know, these peaker plants and use a super dirty fossil fuel, then you not only avoid the cost, right, and you can actually um, turn off a lot of those power plants, but you also are generating that energy ideally from renewable energy sources where, you know, when the solar panel, a lot of the time right now with residential solar panels, a lot of the energy gets wasted because it has nowhere to go um, at the peak times. And so you actually redistribute that in a better way and you avoid those huge costs and the massive pollution, um, which again, you know, an, an added thing is that most of those peaker plants are in black and brown working class neighborhoods as well, in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx. Um, and so really the idea with the virtual power plant is that you start to you know, distribute those things better, um, utilize the system better, and have a overall a system that doesn't require us to do you know, more, but actually require, uh, allows us to do more with less. So my interest in virtual power plants really um, is from a community organizing and power building perspective. And, um, you know, a uh, hundred years ago when big factories were being built, that's when labor unions, you know, the CIO really got strong. Millions of workers joined labor unions. And it led to a huge increase in, in wealth on the part of workers who were unionized because they could shut the whole economy down because these factories, everybody was dependent on things these factories produced, you know, and, and organizers realized that and built really powerful labor unions. Well, today, imagine what happens when a blackout happens. Imagine everything shuts down. The hospitals, everything's running on electricity. Computers, 
you know, you're in the middle of radiology. Nobody will know, like, are you midway through or do you need more? Do you need? Everything shuts down when there's no electricity. So electricity is today what those huge manufacturing plants were 100 years ago. If electricity shuts off, the entire economy shuts down. And what the film clip said, it said, we're at a national crisis point because the grid is at capacity and demand keeps growing. And in New York, they're talking about creating these giant microchip plants upstate that are gonna suck a huge amount of electricity and the state has no plan for where the new generation is gonna come from. So the Federal Department of Energy said they have a choice to either spend $20 billion a year building new power plants, which will not help decarbonize, or they can figure out how to get communities to work with utility companies to agree to allow a utility company to turn up your thermostat four degrees on a hot summer day, or to strike a deal for you to sell your energy from your electric vehicle battery, your solar battery, if you have one, to the utility on a hot summer day. Now, what the clip talked about, it said markets, and this is a business opportunity. The whole key to this is getting communities to agree to cooperate. And so what utilities are doing, they're offering, oh, I'll give you $75 rebate on your energy bill, well, you know, if you sign up and let me control your thermostat. If they're offering you $75, that means they're making $1,000. If they're offering you $200, that means they're making $2,000. They are offering tidbits, little bits of savings to consumers to get them to cooperate because they, that $450 million that he mentioned, last year they didn't start up the Pico plants. That money went into the pockets of Con Ed's and their shareholders as profits. One sixth of your energy bill, everybody in New York is paying for this peaker plants, this additional capacity, and they don't give that money back. So what the way I see virtual power plants, I see community folks, particularly, particularly if you have institutions like hospitals and schools that are working with you, you have major leverage over the whole utility energy system right now. And we need to set up bargaining units. First, we need to organize communities to understand this. Number two, we need to have bargaining units that go in and bargain with the utilities the same way labor unions bargain with employers. Because right now, there is no organization that represents the community when it comes to energy. And there is a lot of money at stake here on the table. I think, and by the way, since the government isn't building new power plants, the utilities are locked in. They have no choice but to negotiate. So the, the thing is us organizing. I think if we do this, if we organize virtual power plants to really be community-based, community-owned, community-led organizations that actually organize and negotiate on behalf of communities vis-a-vis -vis utilities, I think we can solve our problems of affording childcare at our community meetings. I think we can actually have money to address a lot of these issues related to sustainability ourselves. Without having to go to a foundation or beg it from City Hall or whatever, I think this can be annual, regular money coming into community. Now, in Hawaii, there's a virtual power plant, Swell Energy, They've been able to get back $12,000 a year for some of their customers from utilities. They've been able to like build a whole organization. Not everybody gets $12,000 a year, but I'm just saying thousands of years for customers plus money to build their organizations. They've been able to negotiate out of this. So I think we're good organizers here. This is, to me, the biggest organizing opportunity I've seen in the last 100 years in terms of actually building community power, and every community across the United States, because energy affects every community across the United States. And the utilities need us all in order to be able to maintain the grid, except they're exploiting us and paying off shareholders. So that's my basic take on virtual power plants. This is a power building opportunity.
I want to save the planet, you know, all that kind of stuff, yes. But if we don't actually fight, like, to get more money into our neighborhood so that we can actually afford a, a, an EV car or a solar panel or actually afford to have insulation and any energy efficient windows, which right now is not funded in these federal bills enough. If we don't organize and fight for that, the world isn't going to survive anyway. You can't just green rich people's houses and leave out poor folks. We're more than half the population and we're the ones who are not getting green because it's too expensive. That is a political issue. So that's how I'm looking at virtual power plants. Um, I think we ought to jump on this. Thank you. Um, before I go to Danielle, I just want to have a time check. Are we doing all right? And then questions. OK, great. Danielle. I just wanted to add to that and say that as organizations like mine and programs like the Climate Friendly Homes Fund start to push electrification of space heating and domestic hot water as a solution to the climate crisis and decarbonization, we are changing how uh, demand works with the grid, and we are shifting peak demand to the winter, where it was in the summer. That creates really dangerous uh, situations for people who may not be able to turn their heat on if it's too expensive. And so I agree, it's a really great organizing opportunity. There are specific utility service areas where an electrification rate has been negotiated, and so folks who are decarbonizing decarbonizing through electrification are paying a lower e electricity rate because they are both not polluting and they're an electric customer for life. And the, the demand through that building is guaranteed to that utility. And so they are rewarding decarbonization in that way. I think we all need to organize a little bit better around that. If we're gonna tie ourselves to electricity as the source of everything, then we definitely have a negotiating opportunity. Yeah, I, I wanna say one other thing quickly. There's a company in, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard that designed a heat pump which produces heat as well as cool air specifically for NYCHA buildings. I'm looking at Kingsborough across the street. And it, it took a particular design. So NYCHA, after two years of fighting, which is normal, um, agreed to buy 15,000 of these heat pumps. But because we don't have any local a uh, company in, Brook in New York that makes heat pumps or enough, that contract for the manufacturing of the heat pump is going to Chicago. What I know about NYCHA is that they're gonna need hundreds of thousands of these heat pumps, M much less other multifamily buildings because most buildings in New York use the NYCHA window as the standard window. That's a whole nother story. But those heat pumps are gonna be in demand everywhere as an economic development strategy, since we're the ones who are buying the heat pumps and using them, we ought to be manufacturing them here in Brooklyn too and creating good jobs here in Brooklyn too. And there's federal money for that. And we can have workaround businesses to do that. It doesn't have to be, you know, some big corporation that does that. So that's another part of our economic agenda and how it connects to this environmental agenda. Thank you. I feel like we're all, we're all on board, right? We're doing virtual power plants, we're, we're good. We'll meet here next week, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but beyond that, um, are there other policies and legislation that's either federal or state that you know communities can get behind, organizations can get behind, and that we can work together to really address the issues within the community? Anyone could start. I'm gonna start sort of where we are because I think CPC is looking forward to a lot of opportunity that's coming through the Inflation Reduction Act and uh, funds that are flowing through the states because of that, uh, the passage of that legislation. Um, but I think what I do on the day-to-day -day is connect our borrowers to existing resources and make sure that they can get the money they need to fill the gaps in their, their financing stack to build the buildings we need right now. And so NYSERDA has a lot of really great programs on the market now, not as great as some in the past, but they're still there. Um, the Low Carbon Pathways program is a really great solution for multifamily buildings. But one that I think a lot of people don't know about is the Empower Plus program. And that is something that's accessible to renters and homeowners for weatherization improvements in their apartments. Um, so you can coordinate grant resources from the state uh, to make improvements where you live right now. And I think that's, that's something that has been a challenge and we're trying to address in the moment. 
Well, I think the state, Massachusetts just issued an RFP two weeks ago for $100 million plus initiatives in which VPPs were included as one of the eligible categories because they said we want to figure out how to create VPPs. New York is more than twice as big as Massachusetts and hasn't issued anything like that. And Brooklyn, East Brooklyn in particular, is, one of, is where the grid is actually its most vulnerable. And this is a very dense, high demand area of the state. So I think, you know, we should ask Assemblywoman Zinnerman and others to demand that the state do something and NYSERDA do something and provide resources to help us organize a community-owned, community-led VPP here. That's that, I think that's, it's in the state's interest, it's in the community's interest. Um, not too much to add, I think that was comprehensive. Um, the only other thing that I'll say is uh, the Department of Energy has a lot of grants, right, uh, both grants and guaranteed loan funds in order to, for community organizations, right, and for folks, or folks working with community organizations primarily, as well as the EPA, a lot of the funding that is coming down through these programs um, and certain tax credits that are both in terms of around investing in green energy and then also producing green energy, right? And so you can get tax credits around those things. I think the biggest challenge with all of this stuff, especially from a federal level, and that we've talked about is that there is not a really strong um, way or mechanism to distribute that funding to make sure it actually gets to community and gets to community organizations, right? And so how, like, the, the process of then making sure that that happens really is sort of like what Phil's talking about, is building from the ground up things that can actually take that funding because right now there isn't enough that exists that sort of fits the rules of federal funding um, to actually be deployed, to actually reach people and to be um, implemented in communities. So there's all this money coming down and not nearly enough um, understanding and certainly not like etiquette, certainly not nearly enough connection to actual community um, to actually put it in the right places so that it doesn't just get absorbed by sort of, you know, the usual suspects um, who are gonna add it to to their bottom line. But I would say there are some amazing opportunities, and I'll just give one example. Um, Boston Medical Center is, is a safety net hospital in Roxbury. It's like Interfaith or Brookdale. They put a solar array on their roof, and the utility agreed to buy the energy from their solar. And so now they're taking the money they got from the utility, and they're paying the energy bills for the poorest patients who can't afford to keep their electricity on. In addition to that, there's another section of the Inflation Reduction Act called Section 48E, I've learned. And that says, if I'm a, a, a for-profit company and I decide I want to do a solar array on my buildings or on my property, um, up to five megawatts, which is enough for about 1,200 homes. So that's, that's a lot. If I donate 50% of the energy I sell to Boston Medical Center or to Brookdale, to Interfaith, then I get a 70%, uh, I'm, I'm eligible for tax credits. Interfaith and Brookdale are eligible for a 70% tax credit since they don't pay taxes as nonprofits. 70% of their solar array will be paid for by the federal government directly. In addition to that, if companies want to subsidize their solar array by donating 50% of the energy their solar generates to the hospital, they're eligible for tax credits. So it actually makes it cheap, cheap for them to, put, to go solar and it saves the company's money, but also it's a lot of money that would come into the hospital. And that's part of the Inflation Reduction Act and that's an organizing challenge. That's just like lining up companies that want to take it. So Boston Medical Center has a whole office that's doing nothing now but calling up companies saying, do you know you could have convert to solar really cheaply, but you got to give us some, but it saves you money, so it's a win-win. They have a whole office that's doing nothing but that, and they're going to, like, bank. They might even be able to pay people's, like, 
you know, who people who can't afford to pay their hospital bill, I bet that's next for them because that's how much money you can get out of this. Um, I would like you all to give a round of applause to our esteemed panel. Thank you. I have learned so much. I'm assuming you all have as well. Uh, we're going to start VPP so that we can afford childcare in all of our community organizations and fund the revolution. Amen. Um, so opening up to questions in the audience, uh, Dr. Easterling is here as my assistant. I just really wanted to say that. <laughs> I'll take it. I got, I got the quarterback's voice, so I can yell across the room. It's just the, the We prefer the microphone the sometimes, yeah, for folks who may be hard Perfect. of hearing, that will be Fine. helpful. Yes, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, Russell Carter and Kai Bryan from Health First. We're so happy to be here. Um, and just a, a quick statement. This is an interesting conversation because I actually grew up uh, born and raised in Farragut Houses. Directly across the street from Farragut Houses was Con Edison. The toxins that came out of the smokestacks, the toxins that came out of the incinerators, probably is the reason why I have asthma today. And there are so many uh, of, the, uh, of, of my colleagues, my friends that I grew up with that may have other health uh, conditions as well. This is part of environmental justice. justice. Now is the time to organize because now some of these corporations that are moving into the same Navy Yard where God Edison have their smokestacks are gonna benefit and our, the people in our community did not have the opportunity to invest then, now is the time for us to be able to invest back into our community by doing that. So thank you so much. I just wanted to make a quick statement. Thank you. Any other questions? Any multifamily developers looking to build sustainable housing in Brooklyn? <laughs> Hi, uh, good evening, uh, Janice Morgan from Community Board 16 in Brownsville. And so um, I just wanted to share that there is a group in Brownsville, the Ocean Hill Brownsville Coalition of Young Professionals, who actually has um, a group called Brownsville Green Justice, who has been uh, doing some of this environmental justice work. So um, I'm hoping that this conversation tonight can be connected to the work that they're already doing because they're making some really good progress. And so some of those, that funding that is needed to really engage the community and bring some incentives back into our um, local community could possibly uh, happen through that group. So um, I just wanted to uplift that, that group and the work that they're doing as part of this conversation. Colette has a lot of money. Colette has a lot of money. That's my sister's name, but. <laughs> what, what's your name? Danielle. I'm sorry, Danielle. Colette was in the back. I got to mix it. Um, Danielle has a lot of money <laughs> from NYSERDA to green buildings. Uh, a lot of those buildings are in Brownsville that could be part of this program. So that could be a honeymoon right here. Yeah. So it's, it's a fund that was started by the um, Homes and Community Renewal Agency, which is the state housing authority. Um, and it's $250 million that we have to get out over the next four years mm. to electrify heating and cooling and domestic hot water production in buildings. So existing buildings, five to 50 units, in decent condition because it's $250 million is a lot of money, but not when you're looking at completing 10,000 units of, yeah. of this work. Um, so we definitely want to get some of those resources into Brooklyn, into Brownsville, into the Brooklyn Queens demand management areas where we have those gaps in uh, infrastructure. Um, so if you know of building owners who own five to 50 unit buildings, if you have tenants who are organizing in their multifamily buildings and want to bring this to the building owner's attention, that's how we're going to connect with folks who we don't talk to every day. Um, and we have a number of community-based organizations who are working with us. KC3 is one of our partners in New York City. They work very closely with the New York City Accelerator. Um, but yeah, if you bring this to your building owner, if you, bring, if you own a building, we want to be in touch with you in assessing whether we can do this. Thank you. And also, um, I thought it was really interesting that Austin brought up the whole um, uh, the blackout that occurred back in 2003, because um, I recently ran into someone 
randomly in another country and we actually had a conversation around that blackout. And, you know, unfortunately, there's some young folks who don't know what happened um, back then. And so that really is a conversation I think that needs to be uplifted where there are young people who are engaged in this work to really let them know that that conversation, I mean, that that thing happened. It's something that they can go and ask their parents about um, in order for us to really understand how this is a real thing and it can affect us in real life. And there are a lot of people who have very real memories about the three days that we spent in the dark um, in, 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 on the East Coast. And then um, I also want to kind of remind folks, this past summer, Woodhall Hospital had a blackout. They had no power. And patients had to be um, transported to other hospitals across the city. And so um, this conversation around um, you know, electricity and how we um, improve that in our community, it's a real thing that's gonna keep rearing its head and it's gonna get closer and closer to our addresses. And so um, we really do have to get organized around this and figure out how do we stop this from really uh, causing us even more harm than it's already caused us. Thank you, Janice. Any other questions? One, oh, question. one more? Yeah. No, one more question? Mm -hmm. take or comment? Oh. Uh, uh, thank you um, for the presentation. I, I thought it was really good. Um, I was um, overhearing folks talk about this event, uh, and was and, and the persons was trying to think about what would really get s some of the residents. I'm involved in a housing uh, campaign in which. Uh, involves four buildings and they're in fight in a fight with a landlord <clears throat> and uh, so we were trying to get some of them out probably some of them might be actually uh, uh, on zoom and uh, <clears throat> uh, they were told that uh, hey they're gonna have some good food here you know uh, and um, I uh, overheard that and I was thinking hmm I would have said that kind of differently you know, uh, but I realized that telling them that there was some good food here might have been a much better way of getting them here than it would have been if I would have had my way to say what I thought, why they needed to be here, right? Uh, and to me, that is a symptom of how siloed we have become, you know? Um, and uh, the distance that we have to work on to get from being siloed to having a shared vision to working on a strategy, right? Um, Austin, I thought you said you connected thing, things perfectly. Um, I'm thinking about how it is that this housing work that I'm involved in and the food work that you're involved in, and the uh, health work that you're involved in, how does it also connect this into it? How do we get us to a place to where we are working on a strategy, right? And we can start to see these different elements of a civic infrastructure, right? That incorporates a lot of the thinking that I'm, I'm hearing right now. I worked uh, and continue to work uh, for labor union. And you know, <clears throat> what I've come to understand is that, you know, um, when you don't have a shared vision with some folks and you know, if, if you're working on say food justice and I'm working on helping some workers, um, you, know, I'm, uh, you know, the absence of a plan all things go. I could be doing, you know, just focus narrowly on helping some workers. But when we have an agreement that it's important to be looking more broadly than just our somewhat of a narrow focus into the work that we do, 
you know, it creates a whole different sense of things. And it also creates a certain kind of awareness. And it's, it's empowering. And, you know, too many people are dying. Uh, you know, uh, the sister said it up there uh, that um, the air quality in East and Central Brooklyn is the worst in the city. That's what I heard her say. Huh? This is unacceptable. Right? And so, you know, somehow, you know, we have to start taking the risk that, uh, that's needed right now. You know, um, the injustice that we are faced with right now is getting ready to increase. Big time. You know it's coming. Right? And so we got to get out of these siloed places that we are and we have to figure out and we got to get hungry to be strategizing together to be figuring this out because we can do this it can be sensible it can be logical it can be systematic it can be careful it can be everything that it needs to be because it is time y'all it is really time Can I say one thing in response? Sure. Um, thank you very much for that. And I spoke in front of a union that um, Bruce knows a few weeks ago. And what I said to the union leaders was that you're not just fighting hospitals. You're fighting Wall Street. Northwell has 900 outpatient clinics. They're buying up health systems in New Jersey and Florida with Wall Street backing. And all these big hospital chains have, are getting private equity firms lined up behind them, and they're going on like, you know, it's like a monopoly game. They're just grabbing territory so they can jack up prices and make more profits. But I said to the union, you can't defeat Wall Street by yourself. You need allies, and you need to build community labor coalitions, of which this man is taught me a lot about. That's really the answer. Imagine if we got these unions helping to organize VPPs in central Brooklyn as part of a community labor alliance, because Con Ed is also private equity, right? We're, we're all fighting the same thing. So to your point, I think that is the direction we need to go, which is to get more people, because the, the fight is to get more resources into this community so we can fight more, and we can deliver more for the people who live here. And that's a common agenda. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, to, to follow that up, uh, I had the pleasure of watching this movie about a uh, voting rights campaign um, that the original name of the Black Panthers Party came from in, in Alabama, right? And Phil Thompson uh, said to me something that has stuck with me a lot, which was, you know, back then in, in this time period in 19, what, this was 1967, um, black people didn't think that they should have the right to vote. Many, not, you know, not everyone, right? But in general, people didn't understand that their humanity gave them the right to vote because they weren't treated as humans, right? They were treated as less than. And that paradigm shift of actually, no, this is our right, and we should take that right, and we can show up in the voting booths because we're humans and because we're citizens and do that, right? And so that was a paradigm shift that needed to happen in order for the voting, for these voting rights pushes to happen in, in all these communities throughout the country. Um, right now, in this, in, in this day and age, you know, we have matured and evolved in many different ways, but as Phil was saying, these companies treat us as disposable numbers on a spreadsheet. They want, to, they want us to be involved in their organization for as much as they can extract out of us, right? And what we know is that they are, can only extract things out of us because we are valuable, right? They can only 
pay for that. They can only call for us to, you know, pay for energy, to pay for all this food, to do all these things because we actually represent something. And so I think for us as organizers, for us as, you know, um, thought leaders, as, as academics, as um, practitioners, as laborers, and as community members, a role is to make people see that the assets that we have in the community, to see energy, to see food, to see all these things as things that we actually own already and have been systematically stripped from us over time and over generations that we don't even know that we own them anymore. We don't even know that our energy and the, what we're paying for is going to this big corporation so that they can live lavishly on the dime of millions of other people, right? And so one of the things with VPPs and with all of this is also to change people's relationship to energy, to change people's relationship to the resource that they use so they know this is a valuable resource. I am a valuable resource. I And now I want to take control of that to determine not only my life, but determine the collective future of my entire community, right? And I actually have the power to start making strides to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, maybe it just starts with installing solar panels and electric heaters, but over time then I can come with my neighbors and we can decide where we want to spend that money. And then we can invest and totally divorce ourselves from the whims and the price increases of Con Ed because this is ours, right? And so a lot of that paradigm shift is about practicing owning and using and deciding on the resources. But as we've all said, we have to be organized in order to do that. And that's the challenge um, that I'm taking forward. And I hope that everyone else here is too. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for our panel. Um, and um, please always have good food at your meetings when we discuss revolution. Thank you. I think we I think we checked that box. Uh, please also give a round for our uh, round of applause for our moderator, Ray Gomes. Thank you, thank you so much. This was inspiring and thought provoking. Um, as we wrap up, I do not want to end uh, by uh, ending uh, this note by hearing just my voice. I wanted to bring up uh, my compatriot uh, in this event. Uh, I want to bring up Gretchen Susie, who is the deputy executive director of Brooklyn Communities Collaborative uh, to provide uh, some closing remarks. Uh, BCC has been doing amazing work and also been organizing many stakeholders, particularly around this issue. Um, and uh, it is really important that I make sure that uh, I bring up Gretchen uh, just to share a little bit of the work that they're doing right now. Thank you so much, Torian, and it's great to see everybody here. And I just want to say that although maybe tonight is the first night that many of us are hearing about virtual power plants, I just want everybody to know that with the help of everybody here, and especially of Phil and his students, um, Austin's here, Tala here, Tala is here, Brooke is here, Brooke there, and um, what they are doing along with the student that we have working with us from NYU is we've, we've um, the buildings around Brookdale, with a three, a three block radius around Brookdale in all directions. We've gone into the maps and we've gotten every single address in, in all of those buildings, whether it's commercial, residential, mostly residential right around there. And we have every single one of those addresses. And then the students have gone into a solar map uh, software and um, w matched each of those addresses with the potential solar output that they have. And so with that kind of knowledge base, um, combined with uh, participatory action research that we're going to be doing this summer right around that area too, with, and, and, and it is really rooted, um, in the, uh, rooted in all of this work that we've all been doing together, but a real impetus we have right now are re residents that we're working with that Bruce mentioned in the four buildings who are around, that are around Brookdale. Um, and, the, and the issues that they're facing really bridge the micro and the macro. You know, mushrooms growing out of ceilings because of climate change, because rain going sideways, going in poorly maintained buildings where people aren't treat, you know, people aren't housed properly, people aren't, you know, the, the buildings aren't maintained properly. All of these kinds of things are, you know, are, 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 have, have come to, 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 to everyone's attention, to, you know, to all of the, all of the excellent, graceful, and um, collaborative and persistent and generative people in this room, 
um, and and I really hope that you know we we have this opportunity, something very concrete, the virtual power plant, to really to hold on to and to really. Um, talk about with others, there, there's real action to take here. You know, a lot of times in our campaigns, we, we need to get to shared ideas, and we need to get to things that aren't tangible. And we need that, of course, as much as anything. But right now, as, you know, as Phil said, we have this opportunity. I mean, to, to hear you say it, it's a once in a hundred years opportunity. We have the opportunity, we have all these amazing people, we have the tools, we have the organizing tool of PAR, you know, really helps to build cooperation and knowledge and a community of inquiry. That's my shout out to Roger, community of inquiry. And um, to re you know, really pull all these together to get to the critical mass and the type of freedom that Austin referred to in, in his opening remarks. And so thank everyone for being here. Thanks everyone um, f who, who uh, logged in online. And I hope to see everybody back here for next quarter's Health Equity in Action Forum. <laughs>